Hello, I'm Dan Jackson, AKA Dan the Engineer. In this video, we're gonna talk about main supplies to fire alarm panels. Now, what we're talking about is an actual fire alarm panel, a grade A part one system. We're not talking about the domestic smoke alarms. So this is commercial. Sometimes it is in domestic situations, but it's to a fire alarm panel. Now I get this, I ask this all the time. Now I've done a podcast with Paul Meenan and we spoke about fire safety. So E5 Group have a podcast, check it out. Honestly, it's great if you're driving into work, coming home, driving around London, driving around a city somewhere. It's, it's really good to listen to podcasts because it's nice and simple. One thing we brought up was kind of the, where the line draws bef between a fire alarm engineer and an electrician. Now I am, well, as you guys know, I'm an electrician by trade, but also I regard myself as a fire alarm engineer. Now. I like to bridge the gap between fire and electrics. Now, BS7671 has a lot about fire, actually. And fire safety is a really broad topic, but in this, we're talking about specifically fire alarms. So the main supply. Now, this is something that brought a lot of attention. I had lots of messages and there were some comments online saying about the, the main supply to the fire alarm system. Does it need to be fire rated? Now, in short, Yes, it needs to be fire, fire rated. Now, it's a, it's a vital part of the fire alarm system because it energizes the fire alarm panel that does all the fancy stuff. Now, yes, it has battery backup, but it's exactly that. It's backup. The battery is backup. Now, it's a secondary source if the main supply fails because obviously, if we've got a main supply, it's a constant supply, it's a regular supply, and obviously, you know, we might have power cuts, we might have faults, but the whole point of the fire alarm system is to reduce that risk. So I'm gonna run through some stuff. I'm gonna talk through the standards. Now, one thing I suggest is if you work on fire alarms, buy the standards, BS5839 part one, buy it. I know it's expensive, but there are things that you can do. I think NAPIT do if a, a, a British standard deal where you pay X amount a year and you get some standards. I know the SSAIB, I know that the ESA do it. So there's all different things you can do. You can also get a BSI license. I had one a while ago. Anyway, buy the standards. now. The, BS5839 part one is not a big document, so you can actually go through it and it's quite easy to read. Now, I suggest you get them electronically. Now, I'm not talking about the moody PDFs that everybody sends each other, okay, on Facebook groups. We know that goes on. But if you've got it electronic, you can actually search um, and you can search things quite easily. So that, I, I quite prefer it that way. Anyway, if you're, if you're an electrician, you're asked to run in a fire, supp fire supply. Now, this is where it's a bit, bit of a great area because if you're not if you're not aware of the foreign regulations as such the standards you might not know this so this is what this video is a bit about it's about awareness because some people were saying you know um you know electricians can work on fire alarms now bear in mind the main supply forms part of the fire alarm so quite often i used to go to sites and if an electrician has worked on a fire alarm system there's so many parts that are not accurate and not to standard so I'm going to read out the standard here. 26.1 says the integrity of the main supply to the system is also regarded as essential, even though the system has a standby supply. Accordingly, the main supply circuits need to be adequately protected against the effects of fire. So it, it forms part of the, the fire alarm system. So the next part says, the circuits of the fire alarm systems need to be segregated from the cables of other circuits to minimize any potential for other circuits to cause malfunction of the fire alarm system arising from breakdown of cable insulation of other circuits, a fire caused by fault on another circuit, electromagnetic, in, electromagnetic interference to any fire alarm circuit as a result of the proximity of another circuit, or damaging result from the need of other circuits to be installed in or removed from ducts or trunking container fire alarm circuit. So we segregate them so they don't get damaged. Now, the main supply actually comes under this because it's part of the fire alarm system. In order to facilitate identification of the fire alarm circuits, cables ought preferably be in red in color unless another form of color coding is appropriate. So you don't have to have the fire alarm system in red, but, it kind of makes sense because we don't use red for anything else. So it's a life system. We kind of like, you know, it's pretty standard to use that. That includes the main supply. It should be in red. Okay. So that's just a four. So now I'm going to read on some, some further guidance here. Um, 
So, cable systems used for all parts of the critical signal paths and for the low voltage main supply to the system should adequately resist the effects of fire. For most fire detection fire alarm systems, standard fire resisting cables should be considered to provide sufficient resistance to the effects of fire with appropriate methods of support and jointing. Now this is also important if you're putting supplies in. Now this, this applies to fire alarm circuit zones, loops or whatever else, but it also is applicable to the main supply because we actually, you know, it states it there. So in terms of fire resistance, if I just read out, Standard fire resistant cables, you know, your standard FPs, um, should have a duration of survival of 30 minutes when tested in accordance with BSCN 50200. Obviously, I'm not gonna go into what that means, but then enhanced fire resistant cables should have a duration of survival of 120 minutes. So it's, we're just talking about the fire ratings here. So we're talking about enhanced cables or standard cables. Now, Cables should be installed without external joints wherever practicable. All terminations and other accessories should be as such to minimize the probability of early failure in event of the fire, other than in the case of joints or at within system components such as control equipment, manual call points, fire detectors, blah, blah, blah. All joints other than within the system components such as detectors should be enclosed within junction boxes labeled with the words fire alarm to avoid confusion with other services. So when you are installing a fire alarm main supply, we have to really be careful about this because we want to ensure we, we're maintaining the integrity of the fire rating of the system. Now, we a new regulation has come in, well, it's not that new, on fire escapes, we're supposed to make sure that cable supports adequate so if there's a fire the cable doesn't droop down and kill the fire and rescuers they're trying to rescue people from the building now with firearms that's been the case for a long time anyway and now it's not just escape routes it's, it's throughout it's everywhere but with a main supply not only do you have to support the cable in the event of that we also need to make sure that the fire integrity of the of the circuit is adequate so where you get a lot of um, electricians now will install like a metal clip every one meter of um, to make sure that you know pre to reduce premature collapse in the event of a fire. However, with a fire alarm system, you need to consult the manufacturers. Now, when I've done that in the past, we're not talking every meter, we're talking clipping throughout because we're not just worrying about the cable drooping down. We want to make sure we're maintaining the integrity of the system. Now, if a cable droops down at all, even if you have a meter spacing, there might be mechanical strain on the connections or whatever they're connected to. So really, when I've had my BAFE inspections before, when I first applied for BAFE, we used to do the whole every meter rule, every third clip was a, a metal one, but no, they wouldn't have it. It's, it's metal throughout, throughout. And I think it's just good practice these days anyway to do that, regardless. It just kind of like that makes sense. But you have to make sure that if you're jointing anything, that the joints have the, maintains the integrity of the standard, which is 30 minutes, or enhanced, which is 120 minutes. So if you're installing just a standard junction box, whisker box, chop box, even like a, a surface patris, that is not gonna withstand 30 minutes within a fire. Okay, just bear that in mind. So when we when we do uh, fire joints, we might use a metal junction box and we'll use some ceramic connectors or something like that. Because what will happen in a fire, if it's just a metal box, for example, or a plastic, and it heats up, the connectors will just melt if they're just connector blocks. It's something really important to think about, okay? So when we talk about installing mains to the fire alarm system. We have to make sure it's fire rated and we need to make sure that it's color coded accordingly. Always think about that. Now, the other thing is what I see is um, you might have a fire rated main supply to a spur and then from the spur or isolate or whatever it is, it might be a bit of flex, bloody pointless because if there's a fire by the panel, obviously it'll cut through that and it's not maintaining the integrity of the fire alarm system, so that needs to be fire rated too. It's really straightforward, really. It's something I think electricians need to be a bit aware of because although some of you might not have BS5839 part one, 
you, it's quite likely if you're working in commercial buildings that you're installing main supplies to fire alarm panels and being asked to. So knowledge is really important. Now, another thing I get, and this is posted on, I believe, Sparky Ninja uh, Facebook group. Someone, it, it was just a comment I had about a fire alarm um, supply. So you had a distribution board and then you had um, a fire alarm panel right next to the panel, uh, right next to the fuse board, and somebody said, does that need to be fry rated? Yes, it does, from the panel to the um, distribution board. However, they had an SWA submain running to the distribution board. Now, if there was a fire and that SWA was to be damaged during fire because SWAs, standard SWAs, are not fire rated, it would also take out the main supply to the fire alarm. There's no difference. And I've seen it. I've been I've been involved with fires. I've seen them. And so typically what's best practice is by having at the origin a separate board or at the main panel as close as possible to the origin, we have a distribution circuit or a, you know a final circuit, whatever that does specifically fire alarm controls and everything from there on is fire rated. However, the standards are quite clear. The main supply and the, you know, however the fire alarm panel is energized needs to reduce the risk of a fire causing a malfunction of the fire alarm system. Now, yes, we've got battery backup, but we, th these are things that just need to be considered, okay? I'm just gonna give you some scenarios here. So this is our supply intake and this is our main distribu distribution board. This is the front of the building and this is our fire alarm panel. So quite simply, we run a cable to an isolator here to our fire alarm. So this cable here needs to be fire rated clipped accordingly and make sure any joints or anything like that are they do not mess with the integrity of the the system so this one here it needs to be in the fire alarm designated color which we usually make as red so that's quite straightforward and the idea is if there's a fire here you know that's got to last a fire to make sure that the fire alarm functions correctly so all the sounders can go off and we can get everybody out of the building. Now I'm going to do another scenario. So in this instance, okay, we've got the distribution board, we've got the fire alarm panel, but we've also got a sub distribution board. Now what you might find is that'll be running fire rated cable there to the isolator. However, if there's a fire here, here, we've got to think about how, how is that going to affect this cable here? So good practice here would be to ensure we don't want to affect this cable here. Now, if we feed this cable from this board here in non-fire rated cable, and there's a fire here and there's a fire here, we can affect the power supply going to the fire alarm panel because that, that panel will die. So what I recommend is that we come off the main distribution board still. We just feed it differently. You don't really want to run a, a fire rated sub main. I mean, that would be crazily expensive but it's just a consideration when you're designing. Now, another scenario, if we've got perhaps two buildings, so this is the main building, this is the intake, this is our main DB. Now, we've got a secondary building and we've got a fire alarm panel here. Now, this cable might go underground into this panel here. It's very unlikely we're gonna make this fire rated, is it? it's very unlikely that the cable is going to be affected by fire underground either. So in this instance, what we're worried about in this building, because this building doesn't necessarily, we can empty this building um, and alert people in the event of a fire. 
which doesn't necessarily affect this building. The systems might be joined, okay, but whatever. But here, if there's a fire in this building, we're worried about this bit of cable here. So it's just another consideration because if this is the fire alarm, this is the fire alarm panel. I'm doing it in the wrong color here. If we do it in red, and that's a fire rated cable, we're maintaining the integrity of the cable here. But this is an issue. But again, it's just a design consideration. And I think as electricians, we need to make sure that we are considering these different scenarios. And there's so many out there. If we've got a building, this I'm just giving you a scenario here because I've seen this. If we've got a building and we've got a, a, a sub-main from another building, right? And that sub-main comes out into the ground and straight into a panel. So effectively, the only place that there could be a fire that will affect the main supply would be if there's a fire in the electrical room. Okay, so we're in the electrical room and that sub-main coming out of the ground. So in that event, now as providing there's a, a, a detector in that room and that's able to detect a fire if there was a fire in that room, then we could argue that that's okay. But if we've got sub-mains running through buildings, running through escape routes, running through wherever a fire could be that could take out the main supply further downstream, uh, upstream, sorry, then it's just a consideration. I hope that makes sense. If you want clarification on anything, on anything, let me know. Now, thank you for watching this video. I'm gonna be doing little things like this. So when we talk on a podcast, people will come to me and, and you know, it's, it's, it's like almost like an open forum, really. Someone says something, I look into it, and I'll make a video. So I wanna do more of this stuff. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I will see you on another video. Goodbye.